Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. This is a review of the brand new M1 iMac. I've been using this version in blue for the last few days and it's replaced my monstrosity of a 49 inch ultra wide desktop setup. And this is my very first time using a desktop iMac. So there's loads to talk about. Let's jump into it. All right, let's start by talking about the design. Now, this is basically the main reason I wanted an iMac. I was really trying to figure out like, how can I convince myself to get an iMac? Mostly because of the design. It just looks so pretty. As soon as I saw that it was available in blue, I knew that, oh, I really want to replace my desk setup with a more simple, minimalistic -y iMac in blue. And thankfully it's here now. Because it's an iMac, it's literally just a screen. It's an all-in-one desktop. And so you don't have like a box or anything on the side and you don't have all those cables to deal with. If we look on the side, it's ridiculously thin, like this thin, hopefully you can see that. And then on the back, I hope the cable doesn't come out. It's like this really nice, like dark blue color. I'm kind of annoyed because like this blue is really, really, really pretty. So I, I sort of wish I had a desk that was facing into the room so that the blue would be visible. Sadly, um, in this budget two bedroom flat, uh, all I have is, is the blue facing the wall, but hey, that's what the design's like. There is this like lip area at the front of the iMac, which looked a little bit weird when I first saw it, but now it's really grown on me and now I can't really imagine it looking any different. And this is where all of the components of the actual computer are. And it comes with this nice little, little base that lets you do this screen rotation-y type thing. It doesn't really go up and down, or side to side, but it does go in this particular angle, which is kind of cool. At the back, there's only three ports to worry about. There is the power cable cord thing where the really nice velvet, velvet corded magnetized cable goes into. So that's kind of nice. And also on the back, we've got two Thunderbolt slash USB-C ports because this is the base model. It's only got two ports. I have the fully specced out version arriving in like six weeks. It's taking ages to arrive, but that has four USB-C ports rather than two. All right, let's talk about the screen now. And this screen is the best screen I have ever used in my life. It is a 4.5K retina display, which means it has a resolution of 4,480 times 2,520 or something strange like that, but it just looks absolutely gorgeous. Previously, I was using a 49 inch ultra wide where the resolution wasn't that high if it was 5120 by 1440 or something, but I could, I could like see the pixels. But now that I switched to this, it's like I realized what I was missing on and I don't think I could ever go back to a non retina display as my main monitor. The screen goes up to 500 nits of brightness, which looks something like this. That's a pretty bright screen and you can dim it all the way down and you can go all the way bright. It does have a reflective surface, which is kind of annoying because like occasionally, like if there's like broad daylight, you can see the light from the windows reflected in the screen. It's not quite as fancy as the Pro Display XDR that has the nano coating that apparently gives it that matte finish. But otherwise, I mean, obviously it's the best screen I've ever used in my life and I can't see myself changing to anything else anytime soon. But the only thing that was a little bit concerning about this for me was the size. So this is a 24 inch display. For the last like four years, I've been using various ultra wides like 34 inch, 39 inch, 49 inch. So I thought 24 inches would feel quite small. And certainly when I first set it up and I replaced my 49 inch with a 24 inch, i.e. basically half of the screen real estate, I thought, oh, hang on, this monitor is quite small. But within about 20 minutes of using it, my eyes adjusted to the smallness of the screen. And I don't really feel that, oh damn, I wish I had more screen real estate. I think if I was doing something like gaming and streaming, or if I was doing something like doing a Zoom presentation and screen recording on one screen and then having a Zoom chat in the other screen, in those contexts, I might want another screen and I'm considering getting the Pro Display XDR for it. But right now, for most of the things that I use a computer for, 24.5 inches is completely fine. It just looks amazing. The retina display is fantastic. And I'm not finding myself missing my 49 inch monitor. Okay, let's talk about performance. Now, because this is the new M1 chip, we're expecting absolutely fantastic performance across the board because the M1 chip is absolutely amazing. Uh, I have reviews of the M1 MacBook Pro and the MacBook Air over here somewhere. And because I'm a wannabe tech reviewer, I decided to run a Geekbench 5 benchmark and the single core performance was 1728, which is a little bit higher than the other M1 models, but basically within the realms of uncertainty. And the multi-core performance is 7,708, whatever that means. And you can see that compared to some other models of the Mac. I'll be honest, I don't really give a toss about these Geekbench numbers. It doesn't make any difference to me in my life and most people's lives, but I know some people are into those numbers when watching tech reviews. In terms of real world performance, which is the thing that I care about, like it's as good as the M1 chip is. Like I have never once noticed 
a decrease in performance or anything resembling slowness on any of my M1 devices, not the MacBook Air, not the MacBook Pro, not the Mac Mini, and also now not the iMac. So that's nothing new. It's kind of what you expect. The only context in which I didn't like the performance of the iMac was when trying to play World of Warcraft. I was sort of able to play World of Warcraft on my M1 Mac Mini at like two out of 10 graphic settings at 60 frames per second, but that wasn't a Mac mini that was fully specced out. So it cost about 2,500 pounds. This being the base model of the iMac, it's got seven GPU cores rather than eight and only one fan rather than two. And I found that while trying to play World of Warcraft, it was, you know, 30, 25 frames per second rather than 60. And so World of Warcraft was basically unplayable on this device, whereas it was very playable on my old M1 Mac Mini. To be honest, I think that's just a function of the fact that this is the base model, and I'm hoping that in six weeks time, when my fully beefed out model arrives, I'll be able to play WoW on it without any issues. So overall, performance-wise, unless you're trying to play games, you are not gonna be disappointed at all with the performance, and there are thousands of videos on YouTube where people show the power of the M1 chip in video editing and rendering and graphic design and 3D modeling and all sorts of really cool things. So we're not gonna talk about that here. Let's talk about sound now. And in this realm of working from home and having Zoom calls all the time, a, a decent webcam and a decent microphone is quite important. This year they have upgraded the webcam. And so the webcam is now a 1080p FaceTime HD webcam or something like that. And apparently they've upgraded the microphones as well. So instead of taking my word for it, here is some test footage. All right, so this is recording on photo booth using the built-in camera on the iMac and the built-in microphones, what do you reckon? I think it sounds pretty reasonable. I think it's entirely reasonable for Zoom calls. Probably not completely legit for podcasts, which is why when I'm doing a podcast, I'm gonna use my fancy ass Shure SM7B, but this is a bit of a pain to plug in. I have to set it up on my desk. I have to plug it into the preamp and all that stuff. So broadly, for the most part, I'm gonna rely on the built-in mics in the iMac and the webcam, and I'll just use this for podcasts and videos. And finally, let's talk about the speakers. So they've upgraded the built-in speakers, and honestly, they do sound pretty good. They don't obviously compare to, you know, this $300 set of speakers that I've got. But when I was first setting it up and I wasn't sure which ones were plugged in and where the default sound was coming from, I played a song and I kind of thought that, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure whether these are coming from the actual speakers or from the iMac. Then when I did a side-by-side -side comparison, obviously the actual speakers won out, but it was close enough in a way for me to not really notice initially. Like it wasn't obviously a bad set of speakers that the sound was coming from. So overall, pretty happy with the way the speakers have turned out. Let's briefly talk about the ports now. So as I said, this is the base model. So it's only got two Thunderbolt 3 slash USB-C ports at the back. Two ports is not enough. Uh, you do need <laughs> more than two ports. Basically, whatever your use cases are, two ports I reckon are probably not enough, which is why I use the CalDigit TS3 Thunderbolt hub dock type thing. So that just plugs in via a single USB-C cable into the iMac. And then I've got all of the other things I need plugged into the dock. So I've got the ethernet cable, I've got my speakers via USB, I've got my audio interface via USB-C, I've got my Elgato cam link to plug in my proper camera via HDMI. And conveniently, it's got an SD card reader as well for when I need to offload videos and photos and stuff. So if you're thinking of getting an iMac, you will almost certainly need some kind of dock if you want devices plugged into it. And to be honest, even when my fully beefed out iMac arrives, that's got four Thunderbolt ports Two of them are USB 3, two of them are USB 4, whatever that means. But I'm still going to need the dock because I still need USB A devices like the microphone and the audio interface and the stuff that isn't USB C all the way. Moving on, let's talk about the accessories. Now, the really cool thing this time around is that they have color matched the accessories to the iMac. So I have the new blue magic keyboard and the new blue magic mouse. I don't have the trackpad yet, that is on order. Um, the keyboard comes in two varieties. If you have the base model, it comes with the one that does not have Touch ID built in. But if you've ordered the spec'd out model, which I've got coming in six weeks, that will come with the Touch ID keyboard, which is kind of nice. This feels the same as the Magic Keyboard has always felt. It's great. It's the single best keyboard I've ever used in my life. And it gives me the highest typing speed I've ever got, which is 157 words per minute as my record. 157 words per minute. There we go, world record. And then we have the Magic Mouse. Now, I have never been a fan of the Magic Mouse. Like anytime I use a Magic Mouse in an Apple store, I always think this is the worst thing ever because it just feels so bad and so non-ergonomic compared to like the Logitech MX Master 3 or like the Razer Pro Click. But I've been using this for the last few days and it's kind of grown on me. Like the gestures and stuff are pretty nice. And once you get used to using it, it doesn't actually feel all that uncomfortable. So for me, the jury is still out on whether I'm gonna use the Magic Mouse or if I'm gonna switch back to the Razer Pro Click, which is more comfortable in the hand and feels more pleasant. But there is something really nice about the Magic Mouse. The gestures are good, the scrolling is really smooth, uh, sort of back and forth, you know, gestures are quite nice. 
I don't know, maybe I, I, I might become a convert to the magic mouse, who knows. And they've got the magic trackpad as well. Usually I have the trackpad on one hand on the left, the mouse on the right, and I use the trackpad for things like scrolling and gestures and three finger swipe up and all that stuff. Sadly, it hasn't arrived yet. So when it does, then that will be a staple part of my desk setup. All right, two more things to talk about, and that is how specced out should you get it? And then my own personal thoughts on what it's like to use an iMac as a first time desktop iMac user. Let's talk about the specs first. So both models come with the M1 chip. It's just that if you get the upgraded model, you have eight GPU graphics cores rather than seven. To be honest, I'm not sure how much of a difference this should make, but given that my M1 Mac mini has the eight upgraded options and runs World of Warcraft nicely, and the base model with the seven graphical cores doesn't run World of Warcraft nicely, I suspect the upgraded model will actually make a noticeable dif difference for graphics. In terms of RAM, it comes with eight gigabytes by default. There's always a bit of controversy around, do you upgrade RAM from eight gigabytes to 16 gigabytes? Loads of people on the internet have been saying that because, the, because of the M1 chip architecture, you actually don't really need to upgrade to 16 gigabytes unless you're gonna be doing sustained things over a long period of time, something like that. I don't really understand the ins and outs. It's only really a $200 upgrade and when you're spending $2,000 plus on a device, I think the RAM upgrade is probably worth it. So the one that I've ordered for myself, I've gone for the 16 gigabytes of RAM. And then in terms of the hard drive, so this comes with a 256 gigabyte solid state drive by default. 256 is not that much storage. It's probably enough if you're a light computer user. It's probably enough if you're a student and you don't do much video gaming, you don't do much video editing or graphics or anything like that. But for me, as a video person, as a video editor, I basically need a two terabyte hard drive. Otherwise, my quality of life is severely impacted. And so for the version that I've ordered for myself, I've gone for the two terabyte hard drive upgrade. But if you're not dealing with video files that are absolutely huge, then I'd say you'll probably be okay with the 512 or the one terabyte. And you can always expand the storage using those like Samsung T5 SSDs. Uh, that will plug into the Thunderbolt cable and be perfect for storage if you need any more. And finally, let's talk about my overall thoughts and my conclusion about the M1 iMac. Now, this is my very first time using an actual iMac. In the past, ever since, since I switched to Apple in like 2012, so nine years ago, I've always had a MacBook Air or a MacBook Pro, and I've always connected it to an external display. And I've always thought, okay, that's probably fine. Because when I was a medical student, it, w it made sense to have the same device that I'd sort of grab, put in my bag, take to lectures. And then when I'd get home, I'd just be able to plug it into a screen and hunky-dory, Bob's your uncle. But then a few months ago in November of 2020, when the M1 Mac mini came out, I switched my entire desk setup to the M1 Mac mini. So I had a MacBook Pro that I would keep in my bag at all times as my kind of traveling device. And then I had a desktop device that would be on my desk at home that I would use for when I'm at home. And obviously this costs twice as much. It costs more to have like a desktop and a laptop, but it was a big quality of life improvement for me personally. Uh, firstly, on the video front, because often I'm uploading large amounts of video files to my editor. Back in the day when I only had one device, a MacBook Pro, I, I wouldn't be able to really go out of the house while I was uploading files because I would need the MacBook Pro to be plugged in via ethernet and uploading files to the editor. So that's kind of like a niche use case, but, it, but it's also very nice just being able to keep my laptop in my bag at all times. So now with my bag, I literally just keep the MacBook in it. I keep the iPad in it and it's got everything ready to go for if I want to go to a co-working space or a coffee shop to do some work. I know I can just grab the bag. I know I never need to worry about have I packed my laptop? Have I packed my charger? Cause it's always in the bag because I've had a desktop setup with the Mac mini. So that's why having a desktop setup itself was really good. But now in terms of my thoughts on the iMac, I'm very pleasantly surprised by how much I like it. Before I got the iMac, I sort of thought that, okay, I'm the sort of person who needs a 49 inch monitor. I, need, I definitely need more than one screen. And I couldn't really imagine how I'd get anything done by just using a single screen. But I found that it actually is surprisingly good. Um, it does encourage me to be more focused and more like productive on the single thing that I'm doing. Whereas on my old 49 inch monitor, I was often prone to trying to multitask. Like I'd have Slack open on one side of the screen, I'd have Safari on the other side of the screen. I have like a notes app in the other side, Notion in the other side. I'd bring up Spotify every now and then to play some music. I was being like a productivity grease monkey in the multitasking front. But I found that with the iMac over the last few days of using it, I haven't really felt the need to try and multitask. And I found that I am more able to focus on one thing at a time with a small amount of real estate. Your mileage may well vary for this. I know there are some people that can't work without multiple screens, and I'm sure I will get an extra screen at some point just for those edge cases where I'm streaming or doing a Zoom presentation for my course, the Part-Time YouTuber Academy, and I need lots of screen real estate. But for the most part, I'm really, really happy with the iMac. And 
I feel like moving forward, I want my personal desk setups to always have an iMac <laughs> kind of yeah, for work and for play and for, for all that cool stuff. There's also something really nice about the aesthetic of the iMac. So because of the way the cable thing works, it's literally just one cable plugged into the back of the computer and then one cable connecting it to the dock. And the way I've set up my cable management on my desk, I basically don't see any cables at all. Whereas in my old setup with a Mac mini, I could always see cables. I always had to have the webcam plugged in. It would all like, there would just be a mess of cables. And I got, I've gotten so used to kind of messy cable galore for the last few years. And it's such a breath of fresh air genuinely to have just a single screen with a wireless keyboard and a wireless mouse and not having to worry about all of the cables that are in the way. And I haven't used this for long enough to know whether this is actually gonna make a measurable difference on my productivity, but it does genuinely make me feel more zen and peaceful and focused when I'm on my desk trying to do work. And I guess it's one of those things that when you're living in like this mess, you just don't appreciate just how nice it is to not have to worry about cables. And so overall, would I recommend the new iMac? Yes, absolutely, without hesitation, unless you are, for example, a student and you're on a budget and you already have a MacBook, there is no need for you to then get an extra iMac because it you're on a budget. But if you can, uh, then I think it really will improve your quality of life a little bit. It is genuinely really nice having a desktop thing separate to your laptop so you can just have the laptop as the on the go thing and the desktop thing as the thing that you do at home when you're trying to be focused. So thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, you might like to check out this video over here, which is my iMac desk setup completely revamped for 2021. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.